Grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew 6.33. I'm going to follow closely on the outline that you have in front of you today. The slides behind me will be uh, topic sentences for some of the thoughts. So it's Father's Day, and it's already been alluded to, and I'm not going to do much of a skit. I just want to, uh, if this is, our, if this is my children, and, and I'm the warrior, Psalm 127, verse 3, I, I love that verse. Then, then my goal is to be very intentional about where I'm shooting this arrow, right? I mean, I can't be watching television and raising my kids, right? You know, and just kind of hope that they're going to be okay. I mean, that just doesn't, you got kids? Yeah, I got kids. Gee, I, don't you read the Bible? You know, I'm taking them to BBS. That's what you do when you got kids, right? That's not really wise parenting, what I just did. And the reality is that these children are more like, like missiles. And, and, well, they are. <laughs> no one kind of pointed that out. Uh, so the spiritual practices, dads, what that does, it puts the software in the system. Because when you release that arrow, when you release that child into their future, not your future, their future, what you're do, doing through the spiritual disciplines, you're giving them uh, the software so they can hear. Now listen to this. This is pretty clever. God's positioning spirit, GPS. Is that pretty cool? I thought of that. Amen. Yeah. You know, this is going to go all over the world, this, this tape, this morning. So you've got the software in your kids, and God's positioning spirit's going to direct it because it's going to need some mid-course uh, uh, instructions. And once you release it, if you've given them the spiritual disciplines like you've already got them, you're following God's positioning spirit, your children will have that, and that's the goal. And that's a really important lesson when it comes then to the spiritual discipline. Just understand this, direction always determines destination. Intentions do not. I don't know how Glenn and Amy figured out to get to all the places they went to in seven days. I got tired looking at the pictures. The only way they could have got to those destinations is they chose their directions ahead of time. We're going to leave for Arkansas on Tuesday. If you see us going down I-70 towards Topeka, you got to know something. Either we're lost or we really don't care about getting to Arkansas or we've changed our mind. Good intentions don't get you to your destination. And that's why these spiritual disciplines are absolutely important. Matthew 6.33, we're going to talk about simplicity today. But Matthew 6.33 makes it very clear. The way you find simplicity is you establish priority. That's the topic today. The way you find simplicity in your lives, you've got to establish priority. And Matthew 6.33 is a pretty good place to read. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We all said, Amen. And if you've got your life prioritized as the trouble comes, it doesn't say you can't prepare and, and realize troubles are coming, but we can't worry about things that haven't happened yet. But if you've established the kingdom as your priority, when things go wrong, you still know the direction you want to go. And just wishful thinking and good intentions won't get you there, especially when troubles come, because troubles will try to redirect you from what you've already predetermined is the most important. The song said to go from what's good to best. So I'm, I'm reading in the outline here, Ecclesiastes 7.29. This is from the Message Bible. It's good to read lots of translations. I like this particular translation of Ecclesiastes 7.29, The Human Dilemma. God made men and women true and upright. We're the ones who have made a mess of things. So don't blame God. The Bible is very clear. We did this to ourselves. We are doing this to ourselves. And the spiritual transformation, the practices, is how we undo that which we have done to ourselves. Christian simplicity is the decision to arrange the activities, and I put in quotes the messes of your life, around a single purpose bringing them into alignment toward the fulfillment of that purpose. For Christian disciples, this purpose is first desiring the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. And in, as we go through this series, you'll hear Dallas Willard quoted a lot, Richard Foster quoted a lot. I'll be quoting Thomas Merton quite often. Thomas Merton condenses this into a very simple sentence. It'd be easy for you to memorize. To unify your life, unify your desires. To unify your life, unify your desires, and that's how you establish priorities and seek first the kingdom of God. Now, dads will like this a lot because sometimes you start talking about simplicity, 
sounds like, well, you're telling me not to be responsible. Not at all. Actually, simplicity will make you more responsible and more effective in your responsibilities. It's about prioritizing responsibilities. Our first things, now think about this sentence, our first things will always be the next thing. So you've got to establish ahead of time what are your first things. Because your first things, no matter what they are, will always be your next thing. So if you've established priorities and you know what your first things are, then your next thing's a lot easier. Okay? With the pursuit of God's kingdom as your first priority, we can separate ourselves from the messes of secondary things that clamor for our attention. How is it that our smartphones are making us so dumb in relationships? Seriously. I mean, I was trying to figure out a way to shoot an arrow while I'm reading my email. I'm so glad I, we didn't have phones like that when I was raising our kids. Can you imagine having an adult with ADHD raising seven children with a smartphone? I can't even, I can't even fathom it. I, I mean, I can't even imagine. I'm glad I didn't have to make that decision. But now we do, and now I do, because now I have, like, I don't know how many grandchildren. I, if I would give my phone, I could count them. All right, this is, this is kind of funny, and this, this is going to illustrate the point. I don't know if you've watched it, but it was a viral. Uh, we like Hallmark Christmas movies. How many like Hallmark Christmas movies? Go ahead and admit it. All right. Okay, you know how they go. The girl falls in love with the wrong guy, and then the right guy comes along, and he ditches him and marries the right one. And it's a really good one. Her girlfriend marries her old boyfriend. Or if it's a really good one, her mom falls in love with this guy's dad, right? But that's, that's how they go. And so these three dudes came up with this podcast, Deck the Hall Podcast. This guy in the middle, his name is Don Pandoff. Now, I've never watched it. I will not watch this podcast, but it's, it went viral. He starts it off, if you've heard this, Hi, my name is Panda. Pandoff, is it? Hi, my name is Panda, and I love Hallmark Christmas movies. Well, Good Boy in America uh, found out about this podcast. They promoted it, flew him in overnight. All of a sudden, he has half a million subscribers to their podcast overnight. And that's, of course, how you become millionaires in today's economy. Here's what he says, illustrating simplicity and the need for it. When our Deck the Hall podcast went viral, my faith in God and the demands of virility. Virility? Is that the right word? Virality? I've always used it in a different way. <laughs> My belief in God, let's back up here and get focused. My belief in God felt very old and slow. Next to the speed and flash of the entertainment industry and the social media buzz. My prayer life was distracted by the buzz of my phone. I felt lost, tired, and frustrated. My greatest load block to intimacy with God was distraction. And folks, that's why you've got to establish priorities, seeking first the kingdom of God. Because if you don't, the first thing will be the next thing. And if you have the wrong first things, you're going to end up doing all the wrong things. Okay? So why do the spiritual practices? We've been talking about this a lot, and I may be going backwards a little bit. But understand that it wasn't that long ago, two generations ago, maybe. Uh, might have been three, but right after World War II, it was... The way that you fix the human problem were the spiritual practices. In the Western world, the way you fixed a broken human was through Christianity. That's how he fixed people. And it worked, and it still works. It's been forgotten, but it used to work, and it used to be widely applied. Today, almost as widely, the Christian practices have been replaced, come on now, with self-help books. Christians are writing them too. Christians are writing them too. Let me do your thinking for you. Let me give you seven steps to a great life. The spiritual practices are for you, and you need them. In fact, the Bible says you don't have need of a teacher. You have Jesus. It actually says that in the Bible. It actually says that in the Bible. And a mix of philosophies promising success and self-fulfillment. Now, and this is tongue-in-cheek, now psychosocial systems and public policies the laws are doing this now too, folks. You understand what I'm talking about. And deliberate, quote unquote, humans from the judgmental and restrictive moralities of out of touch, outdated Christianity. And Dan Pandolf, as I mentioned, that Deck Dahl's podcast, he said, all of a sudden, my faith in God seems slow and outdated because he hadn't established priorities first. Modern westernized humanity seeks a human, 
you've got to understand this, you've got to understand this. Modern, westernized humanity seeks a human that is very different from a Christian one. This is the pressure put on our homes, our children, our families, through many systems uh, in, in our society right now. This humanity denigrates the restored humanity that the sacrifice of Christ made possible. Because the spiritual disciplines are all about what Jesus has done for us and wants to make available to us. Dallas Willard, who's passed away, I, I'm listening to a lot of his stuff on YouTube right now, said this, Today's personal revolution promises freedom in an unfree world and passage into the good life. Such are the weak new answers to humanity's woes. With all respect and kindness, we, the church, with all respect and all due kindness, quoting the giant Dallas Willard, we have contributed to the problem. What it is we, and I include myself, this is Willard speaking, I include myself in this observation, have been doing, we have not been doing a very good job in obeying Jesus' directive to make disciples. And we as a congregation want to get extremely serious about making disciples who can make disciples who can make disciples. The spiritual practices of disciples position us for the right fix, which has always been a perfect fix. Whether or not we are doing them, whether or not we are being transformed is not the question. Life is always going to be transforming us, is it not? Doing nothing, still things happen. So life is going to be transforming us. The difference the spiritual practices make is they guarantee our transformation will always be away from sin and broken, brokenness and in the direction of Christ's likeness, which, which, which is what I want for me, and this church, and our families, I'm sure. Through the spiritual practices, we are transformed into better disciples, and it's step-by-step step along the way because these are lifetime practices. That are, need to move into the warp and woof, the routine and the rhythms of your life. And this morning, the topic is simplicity. Today's zeet, guys, the buzzword for simplicity is minimalism. Now, I did not use the word zeet, guys, actually, until I started teaching on worldview a couple of years ago. It wasn't a word in my vocabulary. I don't know if you know that word. It sounds like a dirty word almost. Zeet, guys, is, is it German? I'm not sure, but this is what it means. The taste, the outlook, and spirit characteristic of a period or generation. And I want you to think about this in this area of simplicity. Well, I know how you get simple. You minimalize. Now, follow with me in the notes. Today's zeitgeist, the buzzword for simplicity, is minimalism. Owning less. Doing less. And I'm not, I'm not trying to... to, to uh, uh, be self-righteous here or to make fun of, of, of people, but I want you to hear the tone of what I'm saying here. These are the hipster secret to the less stress, simple life. And for some, minimalism is also considered proper penance. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Proper penance for the guilt of Western consumerism and affluence. Minimalism. Part repentance, part antidote. I've got a friend, Luther Eatman. Some of you know Luther back in Kansas City, Kansas. I said, Brother Barclay, we were talking about this one day. He goes, Brother Barclay, do you have any idea how much money it costs to be minimal? He goes, my folk, they ain't worried about minimal. They buy their groceries at Dollar General. And they buy their breakfast at Casey's because there's not a grocery store within three miles of them. And my folk don't own cars. Only rich, and I'm not, I, again, I hear my heart. He just said, y'all don't understand minimalism until you live in, in the hood. Now, we could talk all about why the hood exists and, and social problems that cause that. I think it's because the fixes that have been given to the hood aren't the fixes that God's prescribed, and he would say that too. But he, <laughs> he said, yeah, all you, know, all you, you know, and he was talking about, you know, white suburban churches like our rich church, so like we're trying to pay our bills too, bro. But, but uh, he said, y'all talking about minimalism because you feel guilty about what we don't have. He said, just be a better steward of what you got, bro. So follow with me in these notes. Owning less, doing less, repenting for acquiring so much when so many have so little. Now he hear this question. Do these three things alone deliver what they promise? They are not, and all the studies are showing this. Most people admit that without also changing their overall life orientation, 
priorities. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? Seeking first the kingdom. The popularly praised practices of the simple life are simply not enough. Those who are owning less, doing less, and repenting for having too much still feel stressed. Don't be offended by this. They're still taking medicine. And they're still trying to figure out the best vacation to get rid of everything that's causing them problems. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. Does losing your stuff truly equate to finding your life? Now, I'm mentioning four authors and TV personalities because I've had these conversations with those of you in this church. You have read these books. You have watched these people. So I'm going to mention them because we've talked about them in private conversations. This congregation with me. So it's many. if you don't know who I'm talking about, there are people in this church who do because they've read their books or watched their TV shows. There's minimalism. That's Josh Becker, strong Christian young man who writes on this, written some books on this. Joshua Becker. Dealing with your seven areas of excess. Jen Hatmaker. A lot of you read Jen Hatmaker. Repenting of the American Dream. Lots of you have listened to David Platt. And, he, and he's a hardcore Southern Baptist. He says, the reason we're not living the disciple-making dream is because the American dream has perverted the Christian dream. That's David Platt. Or keeping only that which gives you joy, Marie Kondo. If you watch HGTV, you've seen Marie Kondo. Do one of any of those four things increase a person's sense of attachment to God? Do these things alone bring greater peace and higher sense of well-being? All the surveys say no. All the surveys say no. Feelings of anxiety are showing significant increases across all ages and socioeconomic groups, even among those whose mantras are downsize and less is more. I'm not mocking any of that. I'm making a point, and it's a point we need to hear. Owning less may support a commitment to the simple life, but less stuff by itself, no pun intended, that's my humor, is not enough to carry us into the essence of simplicity. So what about doing less? People claim to be insanely busy, too many competing interests, schedules too crowded. I talked at O'Connell Youth Ranch this past week. I said, you know, you and I, talking to these young men who have been either in trouble or getting out of trouble, one thing you and I all have in common, we have all been there when I made my worst decisions. I was there at every bad decision I've ever made. I, you and I, guys, boys, we have that in common. Every bad hire I made at Veritas, every poor decision I made as a pastor, every bad use of words in a sermon, I was there when it happened. I did it. I own it. Since the 19th, so that means that my schedule is my responsibility. Since the 1960s, the average work week has decreased by almost eight hours. Maybe it hasn't for you. I'm talking about averages. Since the 1960s, the average work week has decreased by almost eight hours. Leisure time per week has increased by almost seven hours. I don't know where we lost, what we're doing with that other hour. But we've lost, there's somewhere there's an hour gone. But so we're working eight hours less. We've got seven more hours to ourselves. Over the past 50 years, however, community volunteerism has declined. Remember that book we talked about a long time about bowling alone? Remember that? That's what that book talks about. Young adults are hosting and attending social events 40% less often than just 10 years ago. So what are we doing with our time? I don't know. I don't know. Did you see on Facebook? Did you watch? Let me show you this video. Did you see that? How can it be that our activities have gone down and our stresses have gone up? 40% say they're overworked. 66% say they don't have enough time for themselves or their spouse. 75% of parents say they don't spend as much time with their children as they would like. I'm seeing a problem with priorities there, aren't you? Something is missing, and that something is purpose and priority. Now, Bill Hybels, who got himself in a lot of trouble, he's no longer the pastor at Willow Creek Community Church, wants the biggest church in America because of his own confused, mixed priorities. But listen to what he said. Again, intentions... Don't get you to your destination. This is a great quote about intention, but you've got to put direction to what he just said. There's no point in simplifying your life if you're steering toward an endpoint that doesn't matter to begin with. The heart of simplicity is ridding yourself of duplicity. As Richard Foster said, simplicity is freedom, 
duplicity is bondage. Now we're going to do a quick word study. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 11.3. It's a powerful word study. And there's a lot more that if you start looking into this word haplos, uh, you'll be amazed by it. Noah and I had this conversation about this particular word that in the King James Bible is translated sincerity or simplicity. Depends on your translation. It may say sincere, pure. It may say sincere purity. It may say simplicity. I know the King James Version does. It's also translated other places, liberality, generosity, and bountiful. It's very interesting how the same word has all of those meanings, but let's take a look in the context. This is, a, this is where you find simplicity and the dangers of duplicity. I'll start in verse 1. This is what Paul says. Speaking as a spiritual father, actually. I hope that you will put up with me a little bit in my foolishness. Paul was the great tongue-in-cheek speaker. He really was. I hope you'll put up with me a little in foolishness because he knows he's not being foolish. He's trying to make a point. Yes, please put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. He's talking about holiness and lifestyle. He's talking about priority. But I'm afraid. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's coming, cunning, got off her priority, but just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The word sincere there is haplos. King James Version translates it simplicity, and that's, that's where I want to anchor ourselves in this phrase right now. In the simplicity that is in Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches about Jesus other than Jesus was, that I preached, or different spirit, or a different idea, or a different lifestyle, I worry that you will be deceived just like Eve from the simplicity that you had in your faith with Jesus, just as the serpent did to Eve. Look in the notes and follow with me. This is an interesting word, and, it, and it's got some, some, a lot of complex nuances. Like I said, it's translated in other places, liberal. Some of folks during the offering time have actually used other places in St. Corinthians where that word Hoplos, this word here, is actually translated liberal or generous. The reason you can be generous if your faith is sincere is because you've got your priorities right. A prioritized faith is a generous faith. A prioritized faith, a simple faith, is a, is, is a bountiful faith. Let me read on. The Greek antonym for haplos is diplos. And for me, as I studied this word, that helped me understand haplos. Diplos means how it sounds, divided or double. Diplos helps us understand haplos. Because simplicity, besides simplicity, other, and I hope you're following with me, this is really important. Besides simplicity, other New Testament translations of haplos include sincerity, single, pure, bountiful, liberal, and generous. The simplicity that is in Christ is found in a faith that is pure and sincere, single, and undivided. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Eve's attention was drawn away from Christ by Satan's cleverness. Her single focus was led astray. Her one simple faith became divided. And then I list other places where this word is used. Other New Testament passages reveal a sincere, simple faith possesses integrity. A simple faith is a faith that's full of integrity because it's pure. It's undefiled. It's not dupless. There's no duplicity. There's singleness in it. Does that word make sense? There's so much here to camp in when it comes to this idea of simplicity. A simple faith is also generous and liberal because its interests are united in God's kingdom. So who and what should be our biblical models of simplicity? And, and, and there's a little bit to unpack here, and I'm just going to rush through it because I've got the scriptures here. But... You know, Jesus said he was functionally homeless. He lived a minimal lifestyle. He didn't have a regular place to sleep. And it appears to say that real devotion is leave your house and your family and follow me. Didn't he say that? He said that. Sell it all and follow me. You're not worthy of being my disciple unless you follow me. And I'm homeless and leave your family behind. If you read it, face value, that's what it sounds like he's saying. I know some of you had questions about that. 
Apostle Paul was unmarried, and he says, I wish you could be like me. Honestly, I don't want to be like you, Paul. I like being married. He says, well, because you're married, your interests are going to be divided. I, yeah, that's true. So I've got to make sure that my priority is the kingdom so that as I'm a husband, as I'm a father, as I'm a grandfather, as I'm a citizen, that my priority is kingdom. That keeps it simple. That keeps it simple. Should everyone not marry? His simple life was summed up when he said this. This is the summation, and this is what you and I need to think about when we're thinking about simplicity. I consider everything worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ my Lord. Pastor, I can't get into spiritual practices. Well, you must not be into Jesus. No offense. The other day I had someone say to me, well, Pastor, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian non-practicing. I'm a cook, but I've never cooked. I mean, I, I mean seriously, he said that. I consider everything worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counted as garbage, dung, so that I could gain Christ. Does that mean he didn't have a job? Yeah, he made tents. Does that mean he didn't take care of himself and, and cut his hair when he needed to and shave when he needed to and buy new clothes when he needed to? No, of course not. But in the order of priority, Jesus was first. These examples are insightful, but we arrive at the core of Christian simplicity when we realize that it doesn't require homelessness or singleness or owning less or doing less, repenting for our new golf clubs. I don't know if you just bought some. I wasn't thinking of anybody. Or your Alaskan cruise. I hope no one just took one. Rather, I mean, the Fletchers see every site in Western America that you can see, and we're going to Fayetteville, Arkansas. I'm pretty sure. I'm not jealous, but we're going to post pictures too, just so you know. We'll take a picture of Aaron and Amanda Bemler and post that, okay? Rather, the heart of simplicity is prioritizing all the things you own and do. In other words, own your stuff. Well, we went to Disney World. Ha, ha, ha. I forgot. Rather, the heart of simplicity is prioritizing all the things you do and own. In other words, own your stuff. Don't let your stuff own you. And as best you can, own your schedule. I know, I know you got to work for the man. I know. But on the back page, I'll talk about, you know, sometimes you need to say no to the overtime. And if they're continually demanding overtime, you might just want to look for another job. Another example on the back page is, I got to work here. I got to work Sundays. I just had that. And my son's a policeman. He's got to work on Sundays a lot. Lot, some other people do. You're going to go to restaurants in a little while. They're, they're getting your food ready right now. They're going to feed the Methodists. Baptists will come in, and then, you know, Evangel Free Church, we come in next, and the Pentecostals come in last, right? That's kind of how the order goes at the buffet, right? That's how we get out in order of service. If you're, if you're doing that, and a church isn't going to be able, available to you on Sunday, you need to find a small group. Or if you can't do that, honestly, you might just need to pray about a different kind of a job if, if Jesus is a priority. You just got to find a way to make the kingdom your priority. And it's not about going to church. It's not about going to small groups. It's about following Christ in your life. And God bless the doctors that are on call right now. And God bless the nurses that are working right now. And the soldiers that are on station right now. And the police. And I appreciate a nice meal after church. I like it that I don't have to cook because I don't claim to be one. And I don't want Cindy to cook. If you want to live as a disciple, you must unify your life. This does not mean your life won't be less complicated. It will. It, complexity is almost impossible to avoid in this culture. I wish it was different. But complexity, I, I can't even imagine some of the decisions that some of you have to make at your work. I, I can't imagine those of you that are programmers the details and, and the step-by-step -step procedures that you follow as you're writing apps and programs. I can't imagine, I don't, I, I don't get the complexity. So we can't get rid of complexity, 
But if we prioritize it, then life will be simpler. No one can serve two masters. Your life is shaped by the end you live for. You're made of the image of what you desire. That's Thomas Merton. This process is incomplete right now for us as a congregation, but we're, we're working towards getting the church out of the building. We're working towards this not being the end of your Christian faith, that this be the means to the disciple-making end. So we're working toward finding a way to try to get everybody acting on what we're hearing during, that, during the week. And I've had the Sermon to Life thing for some time, or the takeaways, all of that. But so, the third page of notes is a lot longer than, than what we've had before, and I'm not going to go through this. This is an example of a possible take-home. I'd love your feedback on this. But quoting uh, uh, Richard Foster, that last slide, I think, guys, where it says Sermon to Life, where it said that, the Christian practice of simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. And so this third page is some things for you to think through, work through, maybe to help you a little bit further along in this. I, I have a spot where, where uh, you could, it's okay to be multifaceted and busy. I am, most of you are. And don't ever think that a stay-at-home mom doesn't have to be multifaceted. You know, she's a doctor, she's a nurse, they're teaching algebra if they're a homeschool mom, they're teaching grammar, right? I mean, they're the neighborhood peacemaker, they're the neighborhood mom. I mean, all these kinds of things. It's okay to be a multifaceted, busy person, but the idea is to prioritize. And so I've got a place where you can do that. Uh, I was met with a, a man this week, and this gentleman that kind of been in friendship with him, he suggested to this guy that, you know, you need to reconfigure. I, I, that wasn't in my sermon, but it's a good, I, it's what I'm talking about. As you prioritize your life, you're reconfiguring it. You're re, recalibrating it. You, uh, uh, you know, we've got a uh, couple guys here that used to uh, check weights and measures, and they had... They had the standard, and they bring the standard in against the weight and the measure, and they check the calibration to make sure that that weight and measure was accurate. And so what we do in the spiritual practices, and in simplicity in particular, the priority of the kingdom, we bring that in, we calibrate our lives to that priority. And, and so when things come along, you know, okay, at this moment, I need to be in that moment now, that's okay, but when I'm done with this moment, I've got to leave that moment. The video of the man coming home from work, or been a tough day you could tell you saw that and a tough day the door opens and he's hi kids how many dads and moms haven't had to do that but it's because you now okay i'm work is priority when i'm at work but when i'm home my mother's funeral noah said this he said i haven't discovered how much hard work it takes to be a fun dad the fun parent is hard work because it means leaving work and and, and being in, in the moment and so that's what that third page is. And it's for you. And we said this already about this sermon series. We're not going to know if this is a good sermon series for weeks and months and maybe years down the road, whether people have grabbed hold of the spiritual practices. But we're becoming more like Christ, then I'm pretty sure it will be because of the spiritual practices. And in the time being, if you need to work through this as a checklist, we'll, we'll do. Uh, you know, the idea that I used for the football last week, you know, Start with tackling, start with passing, start with running, start with throwing, start with blocking, and then put it together into a game. And, and that's what we do here. And so I want to commend you to God and the word of his grace this morning. Acts 20, 32, I believe it says, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which can build you up. Because next week, two weeks from now, we'll talk about study. But I commend you to God and his word that can build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those that are being sanctified. And of course, all this begins with I mean, Christ is your Savior, and hopefully everyone here has had that experience and made that declaration. If that's new to you, then just know we want to talk to you about that. Just give me a call, email me, whatever, Glenn, any of the elders, their wives. I mean, a lot of people here would love to talk about Jesus, and I've been trying to guilt them for a long time to talk more about him, so you're really going to be helping their guilt. Right? Let's pray.